reading from Revelation chapter 21, verses 3 through 7. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am, beho- I am making everything new. And then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. I invite you to stand as you are able and join with me in our call to worship. We sing of God's mercy and grace shown to all generations. We rejoice that God's promise of an anointed one, the Messiah, is about to be fulfilled. Our entrance hymn is hymn number 202, People of East. May the peace of Christ be with you. you. Now let us greet one another in Christ's love.
be seated. And I'd like to invite our children to come forward for our children's moment. Good morning. Good morning. So I have a question for you. How many of you have ever been in the car with one of your parents and they were lost? Have you ever, has that ever happened to you? Yeah? Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. What did they do to find out where they were going? Can you remember? What did they do to find out where they needed to go? GPS, right? What else? What did they do? They would, yeah, they would look on their map, look on their phone, try to figure out where they were going, right? Okay. So, I want us to think about many, many years ago, there were these wise men that heard or that knew that a king, a new king was born. What did they use to find that baby? Anybody know? Baby Jesus? What did they use to find that baby? The star. That's right. There was this beautiful star that they looked at to find baby Jesus. They didn't have phones. They probably didn't even have maps. Maybe the donkey helped lead them, maybe. But the star was what guided them. That was what led them. And so it's Christmas time, and it's Advent season. And so I want you to think about how the light of Christ can help lead us into the joy and peace and hope of this season. And so when you're out and about and you see those beautiful Christmas lights on houses, on trees, I want you to think about the light of Jesus. Because the wise men, they had to have faith that they were going to be led to the right place, right? Yeah, because they, they couldn't look on their phone. Yes, ma'am. Did what? Well, there is a story about King Herod. And, um, yes. Yes, the, he, the wise men met him, and he wanted them to tell him where that baby was. But the wise men didn't. They went another way. <laughs> Maybe. So, <laughs> I want you, yes. Yes, he wasn't a very, he wasn't being very nice. So, I want you to remember that when you see those lights, I want you to think about the light that helped lead the wise men and the shepherds to Jesus. And I also want you to think about how Jesus is the light of the world that gives hope and love to every single one of you. Okay? Will you pray with me? We're going to do an echo prayer. Loving God, thank you for your son, Jesus. Help us to remember to carry his light in our hearts. Amen. And now Lucinda and Michaela and Jaden Sutton will read will light our Advent candles.
Last week, on the first Sunday of Advent, we came together to light the candle of love. Today, the second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of joy. In the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 20 through 22, Jesus says, You will grieve, but your grief will suddenly turn into wonderful joy. It will be like a woman suffering the pains of labor. When her child is born, her anguish gives way to joy because she has brought a new baby into the world. So you have sorrow now, but then you will rejoice, and no one can rob you of that joy. This time of year, we are constantly surrounded by images of the world to be of joy. Ads, billboards, holiday movies, and more are full of people embracing one another and wearing beaming smiles, usually as the result of some expensive gift or extravagant treat. It becomes easy to feel that if we don't have these things, our lives and relationships are less than full. The joy that comes from God through Jesus is not dependent on our circumstances or surroundings. Rather, Jesus acknowledges that, that life is hard and, and that there is very real suffering we must endure. But, but it, it is never for, for nothing. There, there is a promise on, on the, the other side of joy that, that the rebirth of something new, beautiful, and full of life. This is the image that comes to mind in the hymn, O Holy Night, when it says, A weary world rejoices. Suffering is part of life in this world for now, but Jesus brings joy on the other side that nothing can take away. As we continue in this Advent season together, let the light and warmth of the joy candle lift your spirits and remind you that God will always keep these promises to trade your mourning and sorrow for incorruptible gladness and joy. Reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 5 through 14. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. It's good to see you all here today. Before we get started, I just want to point out uh, something from yesterday. Uh, one of the things that I always feel is that one of the ways we, we prepare ourselves for Christmas throughout the season of Advent is simply to do the things that Jesus tells us to do, to do the things that Jesus taught us. And, and yesterday, I just want to just kind of walk through a day in the life of First Methodist uh, yesterday. Uh, it, it started off with uh, us waking up uh, to, to men that we were hosting uh, from Compassionate Hands, homeless men, that we were giving them a safe, uh, warm place uh, to sleep last night uh, with, with folks from this church uh, having uh, provided breakfast and, and cleaning, setting up and cleaning up, spending the night with them and all those kind of things. And, and that's something we know that Jesus taught us to do said, I was uh, homeless and you gave me a place to stay. Uh, and on that note, I will say that uh, as we sign up, we'll be hosting every Friday night between now and the middle of March. We have just about everything, uh, all the sign-ups covered except for overnight hosts. 
and we need men to spend the night, Friday night overnight. So we have decided we are going to do a special uh, on that. Uh, and we're going to offer, if anybody would like to spend the night uh, on a Friday night with compassionate hands, then we will let you spend the night with one of our celebrity hosts. We have celebrity hosts here. And one of those is Wendell Little. <laughs> celebrity host Wendell Little. Or you can spend the night with celebrity host Bucky Hessen. Or not so celebrity host Ryan Bennett. And so what we want you to do is if you're willing to do it, and, and really what we want is that we know that a lot of people are hesitant that first time. And once you see that it's, it's really no big deal. In fact, it's actually really fun to do uh, that you want to do it. But that first time, sometimes it's good to have somebody who's done it before. Uh, so if you'd like to sign up uh, to spend the night uh, one night, you can call the church office and say, hey, I'd like to spend the night with compassionate hands with Wendell. And we'll get you signed up and uh, we'll do that. So if you're, if you're considering that and just kind of like, I'm not so sure we can pair you with somebody who's done it before, who knows the ropes, and let you get that first time under your belt. Also, as they were finishing up, another thing that was happening is at Pickett Rucker, we had a whole bunch of people from, from First Methodist as well as Pickett Rucker and Westland show up, and we distributed food to 300 families, a week's worth of food, in just a little over two hours. We were finished up by 10 o'clock. Uh, now, I want you to think about that. 300 families, and when we calculate a family, some more or less, we don't ask how big their family is. We just ask them how many families they're trying to feed. Um, but we figure about four people per family is what we're calculating as a week's worth of food. Figure that uh, 300 families, four people per family, three meals per day for seven days. That's 25,000 meals that we put into our community this week uh, through this feeding event. That's an amazing thing. I mean, it really puts a dent. Uh, into hunger. So we're thankful uh, for that. And then, and we know that Jesus said, I was hungry and, and you gave me something to eat. Uh, and then last night, uh, this whole staging area was just packed full of our children. And they had been learning and preparing and were teaching us the real and true message of Christmas. You know, Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, hinder them not, for such is the kingdom of God. So for one day during the season of Advent was an amazing day of preparation. Uh, in, in this church of getting to Christmas. So I just wanted to celebrate that in the life of our church. What a, what a great day uh, that was, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, today, though, we continue in our sermon series on O Holy Night, and I just want to say that one of the words that I oftentimes hear around this season, around this time of year, uh, a word oftentimes associated with Christmas, is the word tired. <laughs> Can I get an amen, right? And this has been one of those weeks that has kicked my tail. I mean, it really has. You know, the, the, a lot of the work in the church of getting ready for Christmas is, is front end loaded to the front part because we've got to get everything done and in place so that, the, so that the things can be carried out, so that bulletins can be made, so that screens can be fixed, so that rehearsals can happen. A lot of that work is front end loaded. And in addition to that, all the extra things that happen in the life of a church over this season, like we talked about from yesterday, uh, in addition, I had extra responsibilities in the greater church that, that all fell in this past week. And, and then they have things at home, too. I was, you know, we we're trying to get our Christmas tree up. We hadn't gotten it up yet, so we're trying to do that this week and decorate the house and trying to redneck the outside of the parsonage with lights and all those things. You know, just a whole lot going on. And what I found myself this week was every night I would just get to bed and I would just almost collapse in exhaustion. But then about 3 o'clock in the morning, inevitably, just about every morning, I, my, I would wake up and my mind would immediately begin racing with all the things that I didn't get done yesterday and all the things I needed to do today. Did that ever happen to anybody else? I didn't think I was the only one. I mean, so much so that you, it's hard to turn it off and hard to go back to sleep. And one morning, I finally just gave up, and I, I decided to be useful, and I went downstairs and started wrapping gifts at 4 a.m. Because I'm tired. And I don't think I'm unique. A lot of us are tired this season. And there is a reminder that we need to rest, that Sabbath still applies one out of every seven days. But, but I say that because I don't want to get us being tired mixed up with what I want to talk about today. In our song of the, you know, O Holy Night, we're pulling out a theme 
from this song, and it says, The thrill of hope, a weary world rejoices. And I don't want us to confuse being tired, like I just described, like many of you all in this room feel today as well, with the word weary, because they're not even in the same class, not even in the same family. Weary, if anything, is an extreme form of being tired. It's tired to the nth degree. It's, it's even more than that. It's carrying a weight and burden on you so great that it's almost crippling, that it paralyzes you, that you, you stand there and you're not sure if you can go on, if you can take one more step. And even if you could, you're not sure you want to. Whether it's even worth it. Whether it even matters. Weary is a couple whose marriage is on the brink of divorce and they don't know if this is going to be their last Christmas together. Weary is a single parent trying to work to provide for their children to keep a roof over their head and and the heat on on these cold nights while also trying to figure out how they're going to fill their children's Christmas list only to get a call from the school that their child is sick. And there's no one else to go pick them up, so they have to leave work to go be with them. They're trying to be both sets of parents, just the one of them, and it leaves them weary. Weary is like the couple I overheard that came into the church this week looking for food. A 60-year-old couple who moved from New York to Lebanon because they had heard that there were a lot of jobs that were available here. Only to move from the extreme north to the south to find that nobody wants to hire a 60-year-old. And now they find themselves stuck. Don't know what to do, don't know where to go, separated from any semblance of family or friends. It's weary. Weary is dealing with the aftermath, and that aftermath goes on for a long time if it ever stops of losing a spouse or child, things that you just don't come back from, and you're so weary that you don't know how to take that next step because you're just paralyzed. and You're not really sure you want to take another step. Weariness takes many forms. Weariness has many causes, but the result of weariness is always that feeling of hopelessness, that feeling of brokenness, of feeling like you're in darkness, unable to take a step forward, unsure which way to take a step, or or even if there's a pitfall that awaits you when you take that step. That's what weariness is. In our text for today, We see two key figures of the Advent story, of the story of Christmas that leads up to the birth of Jesus. The story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah is a priest who's given his life to God. He and his wife Elizabeth are blameless and upright, have lived a life of serving God, of giving their life to God, of doing everything that they could of what God has asked them to do. And in the midst of that, we see here that their heart's desire is to be parents. They want to have a child to love and to nurture and to care for, and yet they had been unable to. Try as they might, years went on, and they passed that age of childbearing, and they were old. Zechariah and Elizabeth were weary, they were beyond tired. And in the midst of their weariness, probably a bitterness had set in. And we know that one day an angel of the Lord comes to Zechariah and appears to him, and he offers him good news. Zechariah, you and Elizabeth will conceive and bear a son. But Zechariah is weary. And it's hard for him to understand that, for he and his wife are old and past that stage. She's barren. 
And so he doesn't believe it. And in fact, he's probably bitter and lashes out at the angel. And I can only imagine that. And I'll just tell you this, church. I have a lot of grace for Zechariah. I've been there just a little bit of what Zechariah is experiencing. And I understand that feeling of, 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 of just wanting to cry out to God and say, God, why? I have given my whole life to you. I have given my life to serving your church, and this is how you treat me? This is how it is? I don't understand why you won't give me this. Give us this, our heart's desire. And so I'm sympathetic to Zechariah in that moment. And I understand that he and Elizabeth are weary. They don't understand how they're going to move forward. They, they, don't, they don't understand that they feel like they're, they're going to be just aged to death with no child to love and care for. I know many people in this church right now, in our, in our congregation, in our community, are weary. I see you. I feel your pain. I can, I can tell as you try to hide it what's really going on. I understand the darkness that you're walking in, trying to move forward, trying to put one foot in front of the other, trying to put on a good face for all around you, but knowing that life is difficult, that life is hard, that there's a burden weighing down on you that makes every step almost unbearable, causing you at times to want to just give up, to just give in, just say it's not worth it. There's a couple of things I want to share with you if that's you. If you are weary this day. The first one is I want to make sure you know about what may be the most powerful and important service that we do here throughout the season of Advent. It will be on December the 22nd at 5 o'clock in the chapel. It's called the longest night service. And it falls on what is the shortest day of the year. So conversely, the longest night, the time with the least amount of sunshine, daylight, and the longest amount of darkness. And that service is geared for those who are weary. <laughs> that service is made for those who are struggling. When all the world says it's the most wonderful time of the year, when all the world says it's so joyous and so happy and so merry, and, and that just doesn't seem to apply to you. For whatever reason, for any of those many causes of weariness. And this service is for you. To lean into and acknowledge, to, to kind of look at and see that scab that seems so painful still, so irritated. But it's not just to acknowledge it and lean into it. It's to, to help put that balm of Gilead over it, to soothe that pain in our lives, to understand that in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our weariness, there is still hope. So I hope you'll make plans to come and be a part of that, if that describes you. The second thing is to help you understand today, as we continue on this journey of Advent. As the song said, on the night of our dear Savior's birth, there was a thrill of hope. And a weary world did rejoice. And it's important for all of us to know that in the midst of our weariness, in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our anguish, in the midst of our fear, that we still can rejoice. For Zechariah and Elizabeth, they did conceive and bear a son. And in the midst of their weariness, they did rejoice. And Zechariah and Elizabeth serve as a symbol for us in the gift that God wants to give us through Christmas. Because we know just as to them, the same holds true to us that a child has been born to us, a son given to us. And the government rests upon his shoulders and he has been called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Those words were proclaimed by the prophet Isaiah some 700 years before the birth of Jesus. 
And let me tell you, if you know anything about Isaiah and all that he had to endure as a prophet of the Lord, he too was weary. But in the midst of his weariness, he found hope. In the midst of his weariness, he saw a glimpse of what was to come, and it gave him hope, and he rejoiced in that hope of a child who would change it all. And so church, on the second day, second Sunday of Advent, I want to share with you something that's important, something that I believe will help us as we get closer to Christmas to make it where we can rejoice, even if we're weary. In Christmas, we know that Jesus entered into a weary world. And in the midst of that, all of those things that caused the world and the people who lived in it to be weary, the, the war and the disease and the poverty and the homelessness and the divorce and the evil and the pain and death and all of those things that cause us to be weary are still present. Now, we read at the beginning of worship from the book of Revelation, and that tells of a time when Jesus returns and sits on his throne, when the Lamb of God is on his throne. And there, John says, at that point, there will be no more tears. There will be no more crying. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. And death will be no more. And evil will be no more. And thus weariness will be no more. For the Lamb of God will be on his throne and there will be no more nighttime. For the Lamb will be the light, the light of the world that casts out all darkness forever and ever. But that's one day to come. But for today, today in our lives here and in the weariness that we experience today, the power of Christmas comes in the fact that Christ enters into our weariness and shines light into the darkness that has paralyzed us. It shows us where that next step we can take is without fear of it being a pitfall or a landmine or something that will take us down. It helps us to have direction in a season where we seem to have no direction. And in being able to take a step and assure that that step won't lead to our downfall, then we can find hope. And the greatest promise in the midst of that that Jesus offers us is the fulfillment of the gift known as Emmanuel, which means God is with us. That Jesus hasn't taken away all of those things that has led to our weariness yet. But his promise is true when he says you won't have to go through that weary journey alone. And that as Christ entered into this world in the form of a baby, he gave us hope that we never have to be alone again. That he will be with us no matter what. And that should cause a weary world to rejoice. So for those today who are weary, and the rest of us who are simply tired, know that Christ comes and pursues us and has always been calling out, Come to me, you who are weary. Come to me, you who are weary and you will find rest. And that allows a weary world and a weary soul to rejoice. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our song of response will be in the United Methodist hymn. It will be on the screen as well. The song is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, page 211. A reminder, come, God, be with us. Let us stand and sing.
seated. These are our prayer concerns this morning. Benny Jennings and the Bryant family, the Patrick Ferris family, Randy Burns, Stan Baker, the Thorne family, Alice Gossage, Peggy Hemmentoler, Elizabeth Mulder, Matt Thorne family, the Lenore Davis family, uh, the Lenore Davis, and then all who have lost loved ones. Family of Sally Matthews, those lonely or grieving this season. Students studying for benchmarks, thankful for our youth group. Betty, Betty Ralph and Judy Turner, Bessie Freeman, Linda Stevens, Tim Heston, our church and its leaders, our country. Walter Law, Melissa, Walter, Law, and, the, and their daughters, Lenore Davis, the Thorne family. Let's keep these folks in our prayers this morning as we come to our prayer time. You may pray where you are. You may come to the right chancel area and kneel for prayer. You may come to the left chancel area for pastoral prayer and anointing. Our ushers will receive God's tithes and our offerings.
My prayer for each of us this day is that come Christmas, that we will rejoice in the birth of Christ. And that means understanding today we need to put in the work to not worry about whether Christmas came so that we have a Merry Christmas, but understand that Christmas came to meet us in our weariness, to meet us in those deepest, darkest places, to give us hope. Go in peace. Thank you.